Hello guys and welcome back to our third installment of chapter 8, Skeletal Muscle Contraction and Physiology. Um, we're going to go into the last section of this chapter and then move on. So um, let's get into it. So we're going to begin the lecture by talking about two very basic contraction types. Um, so we have isometric contractions and isotonic contractions. And the isotonic contraction contains two subclasses of contractions. So let's start with isometric. Um, so an isometric contraction is when a muscular contraction against a resistance or a load um, occurs in which the length of the muscle remains the same. So it is a fixed length. So you are still producing force. You are still producing tension within the muscle. The myosin and actin uh, proteins are cross-linked and they're interacting. Um, but in this particular type of contraction, the muscle remains at a fixed length while generating uh, tension and force. So examples of this type of contraction would be a plank or a static weight hold. I'll show you um, images of those in a moment so you can kind of commit those to memory. And then when we have an isotonic contraction, we're dealing with muscle contractions against a load in which the length of the muscle changes. So the length of the muscle will go through a full range of motion, uh, thereby producing force and tension uh, through those different ranges of motions. And we have two phases to an isotonic contraction. And these phases are concentric and eccentric contractions. Um, with a concentric contraction, that is when force is produced while the muscle is shortening. So uh, the myosin and actin are interacting. They are producing force and that myosin head is crawling along the uh, actin proteins like we saw in lecture two. Um, so that is how the contraction is occurring and the Z lines are getting closer and closer uh, to each other when we are doing a uh, concentric attraction. So I'll show you guys what those Z lines are in a moment. And an eccentric contraction is when the muscle is actively lengthening. Um, and what I mean by actively lengthening is that there's contraction involved in resisting weight when the muscle is lengthening. The muscle doesn't just collapse and allow you to um, elongate the muscle without regulation. Um, when we say that it is actively lengthening, that means that tension and pressure and um, force is maintained while the muscle goes through elongation and that protects the muscle from damage. Um, so some examples of those would be squats, bench press, and lat pull down. Uh, all three of those exercises would have an eccentric and a concentric phase. So let's look at that with a little more detail. So on the left hand side here, we're just going to look at the bicep and we're going to be looking at an individual that is doing uh, a dumbbell curl and we're going to start here. So let's say that uh, we'll start here. So when we are bringing that weight up, we are concentrically contracting that muscle. So you can see that the muscle is elongated here at this 90 degree angle. And then when we move it to a 45 degree angle, the muscle is shortening. So thereby that would be a concentric contraction. If we look at the movement going down, if we slowly actively elongate the muscle, then you can see from this picture here that the muscle lengthens. So it elongates. And then this would be an isometric contraction where the muscle, you can see 90 degree angle here, 90 degree angle here, there's no movement within the joints, there's no elongation or shortening of the muscle, but force and um, um, tension is still maintained to hold this weight uh, in this position, okay? So we have contraction, I'm sorry, concentric, which is shortening of the muscle, eccentric, which is elongation, and isometric, which is where tension is maintained, but no movement occurs. So if we look at this with these different types of exercises, if you think of the pectoral muscles, as this weight begins to descend, we are actively elongating the pectoral muscles. So we're not letting that weight crash on us. We're still maintaining tension as the weight's coming down. But what's occurring is that the myosin and actin in the pectoral muscles are elongating. So they're basically getting further and further apart. 
when the weight hits the chest, we can do a isometric contraction where we hold it for a second or two. And then when we have the concentric contraction, it's those um, muscles shortening in, uh, in that region of the body, which is allowing the weight to move back up. So that is the force generation phase. So we're producing a lot of force there to try to get that weight back up. Um, if we were to do a squat, same thing. As we begin to descend the weight, the glutes, the hamstrings, these muscles are all elongating in the back. They're getting longer, okay? Thereby they're kind of stretching here, okay? Isometric contraction would be this hold here. Static is another word for isometric contraction. And then as we lift the weight back up, the um, glutes and the hamstrings are contracting and creating force to help get this weight back up. So these are just some examples to kind of show you how the eccentric and concentric, I'm sorry, eccentric and concentric contraction works and the different types of uh, contractions we have being isometric and isotonic. So keep that in mind. So we need to talk a little bit about how um, all these moving parts interact with one another. In lecture two, we went over a lot of the molecular components and you guys basically investigated how myosin heads interact with actin. And once they can, once they interact, um, they can generate force and they can generate contraction. So let's look at that a, a little deeper now. And let's go into just a little more detail about um, that process. So on this slide here, I want to direct your attention to the first part, um, this left-hand side of the slide here. So in my drawing, uh, the video that I made for you guys uh, with the different drawings sh showing um, excitation, couple contraction processes, um, I did introduce these proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. And basically what these proteins do is they act like bob wire. They're, they're, they're a, a regulator that basically surround actin so that contraction cannot occur without the presence of calcium ions. So this is uh, another form of regulation. We've been talking about regulation in class uh, all semester. So troponin and tropomyosin act as regulators and they basically stop the myosin head from interacting with actin. Okay, now when calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, when we do have um, neural drive from the motor unit that releases calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then what happens is the calcium, as you can see here, is allowed to bind to troponin, right? So calcium is going to bind to troponin. And once calcium binds to troponin, that's kind of like a lock and key mechanism. What's gonna happen is troponin and tropomyosin are under, they're gonna undergo a conformational change, as you can see down here. And while calcium is bound, it allows tropomyosin to move out of the way and for the myosin head to now interact with actin. And now it can generate a power stroke, right? And of course, we have the ATP and the ADP process that we went through in chapter two. And this is the first form of regulation that we really didn't go over in lecture two. So I wanted to kind of show that now because we can't have contraction unless calcium is released. Calcium binds to troponin, tropomyosin undergoes that conformational change, and myosin heads can bind, and now we can produce force, and we can produce force either through an isometric contraction or an isotonic contraction, all right? So these things have to occur first before the muscle can contract. So one thing I wanna go over on the right-hand side is a little bit more about that physiology um, and it's kind of some smaller anatomy within the skeletal muscle. So we're gonna now introduce the sarcomere. And the smart sarcomere is the smallest unit of contracting properties or contracting proteins in the skeletal muscle, okay? So if we look at this here, this is an electron microscope um, representation of what a sarcomere looks like under a microscope. And you can see these very well-defined lines, right? You see these lines here, you can see this line in the middle, and you can see these really robust lines over here, okay? These are called the Z lines, and the Z lines 
are essentially the proteins that will get closer to each other during a contraction. So when we have a contraction, this line here and this line here will get closer to one another. And that's how a contraction works. All right. So if we come down here and we look at this picture here, this, this kind of um, drawn representation of the sarcomere, we can see that we have the Z lines and we have the Z lines. Okay. This is the smallest unit of contraction in the skeletal muscle. We have the thin filaments in red, which you guys all know are actin, and we have the thick filaments in blue, which are myosin. Okay. Now there's a couple of other bands that we have to familiarize ourselves with uh, here. Okay. There is the I band, and the I band represents the part of the sarcomere that only consists of the thin filaments. Okay, the actin. So if we look at this all the way to about here, that is the I band. Now, from this section, sorry, I lost my cursor. From this section on, it is no longer the I band because we have overlapping of the myosin and the actin, okay? This is called the A band, and the A band is where myosin and actin overlap, okay? So one more time. We have the Z lines, we have the thin filaments, we have the thick filaments, okay? Actin, myosin. The I band is the thin filaments that only contain the thin filament, okay? It's the part of the sarcomere that only contains the thin filament. Then when we get to the A band, we have the overlap of myosin and actin, okay? You can see here the A band is the overlap of myosin and actin. You can see another form of the I band here where we only have the uh, thin filaments. And this section in the middle, this is the H zone. The H zone is where only myosin exists, right? There's no other proteins overlapping here. So you can see the Z band, this section here would be the A band. This is where myosin and actin overlap. This section here would be the I band. This is only where there's thin filaments and you can see how uh, pale that is in comparison to this area where we have Z, uh, we have myosin and actin overlapping. Here we have the H zone and the H zone is again where there only is myosin. So you can see again, there's a change in the, the density of these lines here. This section here, you can see that we have the A band again, and the A band is where myosin and actin overlap. This is where the contractions can occur. This section here, we have the I band again, and it's so pale in color again, because we only have the thin filaments. And then here we have the Z line. So again, the sarcomere is the smallest unit of contraction in the skeletal muscle, okay? And if we look down here, we can see kind of a, another cartoon representation of this. Um, so we can see the Z line, okay? The Z line, this is why they call it a Z line, right? We can see the Z line here. So from Z line to Z line is one sarcomere. So again, this Z line to this Z line would be another sarcomere. This Z line, and then if this picture extended out here to another Z line, we would have another sarcomere, right? Here we have the thin filaments, and then in red we have the thick filaments, okay? And this is where contraction occurs. So this is where myosin and actin interact and, and basically produce force, okay? So, oops, sorry about that, I just gave you an answer. So if we look at the sarcomere again here on the right-hand side, we can see, uh, again, these very similar uh, protein structures that we just talked about here is the Z-line, okay? Z line again. We have the I band where it's just the thin filaments, which is actin. Okay. We have the A band, which is where myosin and actin interact, right? This is myosin. Here's the myosin heads. This is where it can bind to actin and contract. Okay. And this would be uh, the center area where we only have myosin and no other proteins are overacting, overlapping, I'm sorry. So now I have some different movements here on the left-hand side, okay? 
And I want you guys to try to imagine where are these movements, which sarcomere might represent these movements, okay? So does this one interact with this one? Does this one represent this type of movement? I want you guys to take a minute and think about how the myosin and actin heads need to cooperate to create movement and force. So I'll give you guys a second. And I want you to think about what sort of interaction these proteins would be having via these types of movements, okay? And I told you guys before that when a contraction occurs, the Z lines get closer to one another, right? So if we look down here, this would be a full, well, it says fully contracted sarcomere, right? So if you guys said that this guy doing the curl here, right? Getting wailing on his biceps, trying to get big for the beach, right? Getting that big muscle there. If you guys said, well, this contraction is a concentric contraction. And when we get a concentric contraction, we have a shortening of the muscle. And if we have a shortening of the muscle, that means that the Z lines are getting closer to one another because the myosin heads are pulling the Z lines closer. So if you guys said, that is the right answer, you are correct, all right? So when we have full contraction, we have the Z lines very close to one another. And the Z lines are close to one another because these myosin heads are pulling the actin inward, okay? Now what about this one? We have the eccentric contraction, which is a fully elongated muscle, okay? No well, I shouldn't say no tension is being created because I told you this is active elongation. So there is some tension being created, but it's not a, an incredible amount of force and tension like we would see in the concentric contraction. So if this is contracted, elongation would look like this one here, right? And we know this is elongated because these Z lines are very far away from each other, right? It's the polar opposite to this guy here. So we know that little force is being produced because if you guys look at the overlap between myosin and actin, there's very little overlap, right? The I bands are very long in this, in this particular example, which means that there's a lot of actin here that isn't communicating with or interacting with the myosin. If you look at this one here for the full contraction, look at the I band it's completely interacting with the myosin heads. It's every point of contact is being made, right? So in this one here, we still have a lot of the I band that is not uh, interacting with the myosin head. So if we thought that this guy here was being represented by this sarcomere, then you were right, okay? So if this bicep muscle is elongated, right? The Z lines are far away from one another, and there is very limited myosin and actin interaction. Now, if we have the last one here where we have the bicep contracting, but it's isometric, right? It's not going through this full range of motion like this one here. Then you can see that because we have to produce more force, right? The weight being here is going to require more force to be produced than the weight being here, right? And also the bicep muscle is going to be smaller here because we have to contract to get that weight to move there. So this guy, this sarcomere is representing this type of isometric contraction, okay? And it's in between the fully contracted and the relaxed. And you can see again, the Z lines are closer to each other because there is a contraction versus this one where we're relaxed. It's not a full contraction, so the Z lines aren't as close as the fully contracted sarcomere. Okay, but you can see that there's much more myosin and actin interaction in this contracting phase versus this relaxed phase. And the Z line from the Z lines from the relaxed phase has moved from here to here. Okay, so we have this Z line and this Z line getting closer to one another. Okay, so those are just some pictures to kind of represent what is occurring when myosin and actin uh, are allowed to interact 
and force and contraction is being conducted. So now we're going to talk about something called the length tension relationship and this is going to refer to uh, the position of the sarcomere. Again, the sarcomere is the um, smallest functional contractile unit. We just kind of went over that on the previous slides. So if you pay attention to the myosin and actin interaction, um, the myosin heads interacting with the actin produces tension. Now, something we have to think about is the length at which actin and myosin um, are oriented. So let's look at this section over here. Uh, we have the Z-line here, the Z-line here. We have the actin, the actin. This would be the myosin, and this would be the myosin head. Now, because the length of the Z-lines are so far apart from one another, we can see that there are no myosin heads interacting with actin and this is problematic because if the length is too far then there's no tension being produced so i want you to think about uh, as we move forward in these next few slides goldilocks and the three bears and think about any one of those lines that goldilocks says where this is too hot this is too cold or this is just right or this bed's too hard this bed's too soft this bed's just right so myosin and actin uh, within a sarcomere, they have a length that is optimal and that is just right. And we're going to explore this over the next few slides to really kind of understand the details of this relationship. So if there is no myosin heads interacting with actin here, then we know that there is no tension being produced. Okay, And that's problematic. So this would be the bed that is too soft, okay? If we look over on the other side over here, we can see that there are a lot of myosin head interacting with actin. There are Z lines that are close to one another, okay? So that means a contraction has occurred. But what's problematic here is that we have some actin that is overlapping with each other. And what this does is this creates a situation where certain myosin heads won't have play partners uh, in the counterpart actin because these two are overlapping one another. And if they're overlapping one another, that means that there's sections here in which myosin can't bind to actin to help create tension. All right, so this would be the bed that's too hard. This would be the bed that's too soft and this would be the bed that's just right, okay? So this would be less than optimal contraction um, status because the sarcomere is blunted. Uh, we basically have this overlap here, which means that myosin cannot bind to either of these heads, okay? So we're not producing much force at all. The Z lines are already close to one another, uh, which means that they're gonna have very little space to continue contracting which therefore means that they cannot produce any more force. Over here, no myosin heads acting, interacting with actin, therefore no force being produced. And then this one is just right. So um, now think about the movement states that we would observe these conditions in. So let's go back to the curl again, okay? If we picked up a curl bar and we let the weight just kind of fall and our arms were elongated, uh, and we did not start curling yet, uh, let's say the bar was um, resting right under our hips, okay? We're just about to start the curl exercise. This would be the condition of the myosin and actin or the sarcomere. This would be the state that it would be in. Uh, we might have a couple myosin heads interacting with the actin because uh, we are creating some tension while the bar is resting, um, but we have limited interaction, okay? Now, if we were to bring that curl bar up to a 90 degree angle, so it's no longer resting right under our hips, we're actually uh, using force production and tension to move the weight, and we stopped it right at a 90 degree, degree angle, this is the uh, orientation that the sarcomere would be in, okay? So we're producing a lot of force, a lot of tension, and uh, this is a favorable confirmation.
Now, if we brought that curl bar all the way up to our chin and we had a concentric attract contraction and um, we were not able to contract any more, that would be because we would be in a position like this where we have completely contracted the sarcomere, the Z bands are close to one another, the I bands are overlapping one another, and this is not the optimal place for us to produce any more tension. So if we look at the next slide, it kind of tells us that this less than optimal length would be in a position like this, okay? Greater than optimal length means that this is so far apart that we cannot produce any tension. So this is exceedingly far from one another. And this one is just right. So a lot of textbooks will give us, give us this um, 2.25 micrometers, uh, the whole bunch of different textbooks say 2.0, 2.75. Just understand that there is an optimal length and this is where we have the maximal cross bridge interaction and that was what you would see here, okay? No cross bridge interaction maximal cross bridge interaction and this is a blunted cross bridge interaction because again these I bands here this actin is overlapping and they don't have any myosin play partners to help produce any more tension so now let's look at a little more in this length tension uh, relationship graph and let's talk about this a little bit okay uh, these cues here are just kind of something for you to read on your own. I'm going to walk you through it over here and um, we're going to kind of understand what this graph represents and symbolizes. So I told you that there is an optimal resting length for muscles to produce tension. So if we look at the x-axis down here, we can see that this would be the length of the sarcomere. Okay, so we can see this is a sarcomere here. This is a functional unit, right? Uh, we know that sarcomeres can contract, as you can see here, and they can expand, as you can see here, okay? So this is the length of the sarcomere. And this over here would be the tension that is being produced, uh, not from one sarcomere, but all the sarcomeres uh, in a muscle contracting together, okay? So that's how we move weight. That's how we move load. Uh, that is placed on the muscle is all of the contractile units contract at one time as a singular contraction and that's what produces that force and that's what produces that tension okay so we have tension and we have length okay let's look at number two because this is the optimal sarcomere orientation and this is where we want to start okay so we have the z lines again the i right the A band, here's the I again, here's the Z. Okay, we're familiar with these now. We can see that the myosin heads have plenty of actin to interact with, and the Z bands have plenty of room to move, okay, to, can, to get closer to one another because of the contraction, right? So if the myosin heads have plenty of actin to interact with and to contract with, then that gives optimal range for the Z-bands to get closer to one another, okay? And again, this textbook identifies this optimum range at about 2.15 micrometers, some, somewhere around there, okay? So now let's pay attention to this line a little bit. Let's pay attention to the trends on this line, okay? If we come down on this side, we can see that there is a gradual loss of tension. Okay, so I want you to think about this position here. Okay, if we have a person that is fully extended, okay, we would have a sarcomere that looks like this. Okay, and little, little tension can be produced here because if you look at this sarcomere, you can see that myosin heads are not capable of interacting with actin because the, the distance is too far, which means very little tension can be produced. Now, if this individual started to move this curl bar up here, or the dumbbell up here, we would see that that subtle contraction would cause the myosin and the actin to move closer together. Now, we still don't have optimum force production because we don't have these myosin heads here 
They don't have any play partners. They don't have any actin to interact with. We just have this section right here interacting with this actin. So we don't have much tension being produced here, okay? So um, ideally, we want overlap of the myosin and the actin to produce tension, and that's why this guy here is a perfect representation of that, okay? Now, if we look at the other side here, we can see a very different trend line, okay? If we look here, we see that there is a slight decrease in tension, okay? And that's because this actin here is not interacting with any myosin. Do you guys see that? And we know that this H line right here in the middle, there's no myosin there, right? This is, I'm sorry, there's no myosin heads there. So this H line is absent of heads, of myosin heads. So if we look at the decrease in force production from here to here, it's because the actin are beginning to overlap and they're overlapping in a section where myosin doesn't have heads to bind to that actin, okay? And then if we look from here to here, this, this rapid fall in tension, the ability to produce tension, if you pay attention to the actin here, look at that overlap of the actin. There's so much overlap of the actin here and here. And again, in the middle of this myosin, there's no heads to help create contraction or to help create tension. So there's all this dead space here where myosin cannot interact with actin. And this picture would be a representation of this right here, right? We have a full, fully contracted muscle. The Z lines are very close to one another. And then we have overlapping uh, um, actin and we have this dead space here where myosin heads cannot communicate with or interact with that actin, okay? So, uh, from this position, right, which would be here, to this position, which would be here, right? Go back to the three bears. This is too hot, this is too cold, and this is just right, all right? So this would be the optimal length tension relationship or length of myosin and actin to interact to generate, if you look here, the highest amount of tension, which would be, uh, 90, what is this, percent of maximum force production, okay? So at this optimal length, we produce optimal tension, which would be 90. At suboptimal length, we produce suboptimal tension. And then way down here, if we look at this guy here, we produce, you know, 20% of our maximum tension, okay? So keep all of that in mind. So now we're gonna talk about muscle soreness and what are some of the mechanisms that are involved in creating an acute inflammatory response in muscle uh, after we exercise it and is it necessary uh, and why it's necessary. So there are two types of soreness that we'll be talking about today. And one of them are acute soreness, which generally happens uh, within the gym or immediately following uh, the gym. If you are leaving, uh, you're done wailing on your pecs for the day and trying to get those beach muscles, then you can experience acute muscle soreness uh, in real time. And some of the causes of acute muscle soreness, it, it could be any one of these uh, or a combination of all of these, um, is vascular occlusion. So when you guys are exercising and you have contracting muscles constantly occluding uh, your vascular system, then that is going to cause a lack of oxygen and inefficient oxygen being delivered to muscle, muscle tissue, which will create oxygen debt uh, or an oxygen deficit. So if you guys uh, were drinking out of a straw and you took your forefinger and your thumb and you pinched that straw and then you try to suck up the contents of your cup uh, through that straw, it would be very hard because you're occluding the straw. Uh, this is the same thing that happens to the uh, vascular system in your body when you exercise. 
So if you think about a long, drawn out, uh, strenuous contraction, such as a deadlift, right? And a lot of weight being put on the bar when somebody's doing a heavy deadlift. Uh, some guys or gals will put up that weight, uh, drop the bar, and then pass out. And one of the reasons they pass out is because they, through that entire contraction, have occluded their vascular system, had stopped the blood flowing to essential uh, muscle tissue, have caused a spike in blood pressure because of the occlusion. And then once the muscles relax, all that blood uh, will then flourish or uh burst back back through the, the vascular system uh, so you'll have a rapid decline in blood pressure and then um, people become lightheaded by this or they, they sometimes pass out by this. Um, so again, another reason we can experience acute muscle soreness is because uh, when we are doing certain types of exercise, we are, uh, rely more on anaerobic pathways uh, such as glycolysis and lactic acid. Um, will build up when we're using those anaerobic pathways. So lactic acid and the presence of hydrogen ions could be um, um, a contributor to this, basically contributing to localized acidosis. Um, so these are very acute things that happen in real time in the gym during your workout. Um, but then we have on the other side over here, we have delayed onset muscle soreness, which is something that occurs over the course of 48 hours to 72 hours or sometimes even prolonging uh, in, into further um, time frames is delayed onset muscle soreness, which is a long term um, soreness and what happens is you might you guys might do uh, a workout and then then the day you do the workout you feel fine the next morning you wake up you're sore right it's it's difficult to get out of bed and then the following day after that you're even more sore than you were the previous day uh, this is an example of delayed onset muscle soreness and there are three factors that can increase this uh, soreness after a workout so Lack of previous training, if, if you're doing something that is uh, very new to you, uh, so let's say you haven't exercised in six, seven months, or you've never exercised at all, uh, you will probably get a very intense bout of delayed onset muscle soreness. If you are somebody that regularly works out and you are trying something new, so, which, which we're calling a novel stimuli, uh, and you're working the body and the muscles in a different pattern than it's used to, uh, you can get a very intense um, bout of DOMS. And then if you are increasing weight while you're exercising or while you're working out with weights, that increased load on your eccentric contractions could cause more damage to the contracting filaments and those contractile proteins which then those proteins have to heal themselves, okay? So when we increase load, we're also increasing the chances of delayed onset muscle soreness because the body is going to have to repair the contractile proteins um, that that weight has created, the environment that is created for the muscle. So, uh, so the causes of delayed onset muscle soreness, we, a lot of people got this wrong over the last 30, 20, 30 years, and they believe that DOMS was a result of lactic acid and acidosis, but it is not. Um, it is not caused by lactic acid buildup, okay? It is caused by muscle tear, inflammation, the inflammatory response, tenderness, and pain. So this is what DOMS comes from. And to kind of show you a visual representation of what happens to skeletal muscle after you exercise with weight and you add load to um, contracting proteins such as myosin and actin, you get something that looks like this. So this would be damage to the contractile properties in human skeletal muscle. And if you look here at somebody that did not exercise, you should see some structures that are very familiar to you. You should see the Z lines here, right? This would be your sarcomere, your small unit of contraction. And you can see that there's all these different sarcomeres, right? Z line, Z line, Z line. Then we have the actin by itself, right? The I. Then we have the myosin and actin overlap, which would be the A, and you can see it's much darker there. Then we have this H zone, right? Where it's only the myosin that does not have myosin heads. 
and then we're back into the A, back into the I, and then the Z again, okay? So when we increase eccentric loading and uh, we increase weight on that eccentric contraction, look what happens to these very clean, well, they were once clean, uh, sarcomeres, right? So here's sarcomeres that are still intact. And here is the tears and the destruction that has happened with uh, adding load and weightlifting. So I thought this was a cool picture to show you guys to show you what happens to muscle when you exercise. The more intense the exercise, the more damage that you can inflict upon the contractile properties of the muscle. And then delayed onset muscle soreness happens because all of this has to be repaired. And through that repair process, you have inflammation, you have tenderness, you have pain, and that is a result of um, the bout of exercise that you had conducted. So that is all I have for you guys. And uh, this concludes chapter eight, skeletal muscle uh, physiology and contraction. And uh, stay well.